Target zero. Target zero, yes, yes. You want to see zero deaths. Welcome to Community Conversations. Uh, my name is Jason Bannon. I'm a Wallingford resident. Uh, I'm also an employee assistance uh, professional with a local labor union, uh, helping people uh, with all sorts of issues from financial to substance abuse and everything in between. And today I'm talking with uh, Sylvester. Thank you, Jason. Um, again, for our audience, I'm Sylvester Salcido. I'm the guy who's not the uh, Wallingford resident. I'm actually uh, from Orange. And just by way of a quick introduction, I'm an attorney in private practice. I'm also a 20-year Navy veteran. I uh, served in the Navy uh, from the time I graduated college uh, from Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. My 20-year service, both active duty and reserve uh, time, was from 1979 to 1999. So I retired as a lieutenant commander. So what brings us together today is obviously the uh, opioid crisis that we are experiencing here in Connecticut. Although we may not agree on everything with, with the opioid crisis and how to, to combat it, I, I think at the end of the day, both of us, we, and we were talking, both of us right. uh, really want to see zero deaths. In the state of Connecticut. In the state of Connecticut. Well, I'd like to see zero deaths across, you know, the, the world. world. Yes, but, agreed. But, I agree. You know, but here in Wallingford and being a Wallingford resident, and uh, you know, we do have a, a large population here. And and um, well, let's start with Wallingford. Sure. What, what's Wallingford's uh, uh, specific experience? Like, let's say with with last year, did anybody die of a heroin opioid related overdose they in did. Wallingford for last and, year and it's been growing uh, there's been um, a lot of overdose deaths here in Wallingford at one point we were the leader in Connecticut and Connecticut what were the numbers? Whole, uh, we've had 94 overdose as of two years ago there was 94 overdose deaths over the course of about five years okay uh, in Wallingford and sometimes the, the numbers don't reflect what actually is happening there's there's more people uh, unfortunately, we had one girl who had overdosed and rolled over on her child, and the okay. child died as right. well. So, okay. you know, that's an unintended consequence of, of, of an opiate overdo yeah. uh, overdose. Um, so the numbers don't always reflect what, what actually happens, you know. Correct, correct. The peripheral and sort of collateral yeah. events that happen around the life of uh, somebody who's unfortunately addicted or has a dependency issue with heroin or opioids. But I do know that across the state of Connecticut it was a thousand, 1,040 people. Right, okay, that sounds about right. And died in, in, in Connecticut. And okay. one's too many. I mean, we can Agreed. agree on that. Well, how do we get to zero? Right. Target zero. What okay, do you think? Well, I think that in Connecticut we've made a lot of a ground over the, the last several years. Um, I was part of an effort to uh, get the legislation that was passed where now uh, doctors can only prescribe one week of opioid medication okay. in the state of Connecticut. Okay. Before it was carte blanche, you could get a 90-day right. supply, there was a lot of diversion, uh, people are selling it on the street. How does it go from that to, to heroin? Because a lot of heroin users will tell you that they started with pills, either right. out of okay. either out of their, you know, their, their home medicine cabinet Right. Uh, or uh, friends' medicine cabinets, or you know they had an injury, sports related. We were talking right. our kids. You know, I, I too am a father of two boys, fourteen and eleven. They play sports. You know, uh, try not to be terrified about it, but sports are are sports. And if mm -hmm. they get hurt, you know, and they go to the doctor, are they going to be given a, a heavy narcotic medicine? Um, and a lot of people start out with those medicines, and it becomes right. a financial decision at some point to turn to heroin because the right. doctor shuts you off. You experience pain or discomfort because you're withdrawing from the medication, right. and and then it becomes a financial decision to go to heroin because it's cheaper. Right. Well, the the other issue that I think probably will will be uh, a source of uh, deep concern and fear for parents, like the uh, social pressures amongst peer groups. Obviously, like for example, you can imagine a scenario where a young man or young woman is 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 very much involved with sports and and athletic uh, activities but yet we'll have an unfortunate uh, accident or sprain knee or something like that and because they want to maintain their level of performance may not necessarily go to mom and dad and say jay you know i really hurt myself uh, at, at practice yesterday but amongst their peers they'll just say hey jay you know just take this little magic pill here and and it will make you feel better as innocently as that where one peer trying to help another and then it just basically goes downhill from there there are many unknown, shall we say, 
influences factors that will come into an individual's life. What do we do? We're supposed to be the adults in the room. And we say, whether it's to a youngster who, who's, who was injured in, a, in an athletic event or, or you know, a traffic accident or something like that, or even an older person who is suffering from back pain, knee pain. I mean, I'm 61 now and I have to sort of get out of bed a little slower in the morning and not just jump out as I did when I was in the Navy at age 22. So there are all these risks that we're always faced with. But the key is, what do we do as a community here in Wallingford, in Orange, across the state of Connecticut? So like you, I share your concern that we really should get to zero. Here are my ideas. My experience has never been anything personal. Like people always ask me, they say, Sylvester, why are you involved with this activity? And I've come up with something I call the CHU, the Connecticut Heroin Users Union, about four or five years ago. It was really in reaction to an article, actually it was an editorial I saw in the uh, New Haven newspapers. Back then, 2014, it said, you know, there's this uh, return of the, the heroin epidemic and it's now a call to arms. Well. Nobody answered that call to arms, except me. I mean, I, 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 I went and I, I called the newspaper and I said, hey, I have this five-point plan. You know, and, and, and my five-point plan, no new taxes, wasn't going to cost anything, but really what it is was simply this, that the philosophy is uh, no BS, meaning no blame, no shame. doesn't matter how the individual developed that addiction to heroin or opioids, whether it was a young athlete an older person with, with, with a knee injury or, or, or a painful uh, toothache, we would meet them where they are. We won't blame them, we won't shame them. And what we do is we offer them T, T-E-A, tolerance, empathy, and acceptance. You are where you are. You've now become addicted to the substance. What we will do instead is accept you for where you are in your life, not push you, not make anything coercive like the courts do where they say, you, buy, you, you, you capture somebody in a, in a buy and bust operation out in the streets buying heroin uh, from, from a local dealer, and we say, you have to get clean or we're gonna throw you in jail. To me, that's wasteful. It's, it's, it's not the way to go from my experience and from my um, knowledge of what I've done in, in, in researching this issue. To me, it's preferable that we bring the person in and have an open and honest dialogue like you and I are having now, and just say to the individual, Question number one, what, what will it take to stabilize your life so that you're not stealing, you're not lying, you're not cheating, you're not prostituting yourself to buy heroin on the streets for roughly anywhere from $10 a bag to $5 a bag. You could have a big sale and have it $3 a bag. Still, you're having to pay for some substance you don't even really know its level of purity or what's mixed with and, 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 and so there are a lot of uh, unknowns about the quality and and, um, and of the substance that you're actually buying from the streets. So to me, this is where the idea of the Connecticut Heroin Users Union will bring all these individuals who are addicted, who are uh, former users, and those who may be in active recovery programs, rehab, um, any kind of, any kind of uh, medically assisted uh, treatment program, so that we're always with you throughout your whole journey. It's not like you're with us for a 30 day period and then hi and then bye 30 days later. Mm -hmm. We are with you when you are with this Connecticut Heroin Users Union. Uh, I guess the most controversial part about this program or idea that I'm trying to share with people is the part where I'm supporting the issuance of pure pharmaceutical clean heroin. That's not produced in the streets, but rather in a pharmacy, the way they produce my, my vitamins or they produce my high blood pressure medication or you know, uh, the EpiPens for my children. You know, I just don't buy EpiPens from, from the corner or out here in, in, in Wallingford Green. I get it from the pharmacy. So that's essentially um, what I'm offering in, in the conversation. And what I, do you think? Do you I agree 100%? No, I don't agree with you 100%. We talked All right, about this let's earlier. Take, well, let's Listen, take I, I can totally agree with meeting somebody where they're at. In my own okay. profession, I, I meet them wherever they are at. Okay. Right? I, I try not, not to put my own personal bias or opinion in whatever's going on in somebody else's life. So that's the no BS part, no blaming, that, right, no that's, shaming. Right, that's okay. the, the no we blaming, agree on the, the no shaming. All right. The, the, the empathic thing. I'm totally behind that as well. Okay. What I can't what I can't get behind is is supplying someone with heroin. 
whether it's clean Sylvester yeah. heroin right, right, or, yes. or, or not, because at the end of the day, it's still a central nervous system depressant, right? It's also, right. It, no matter what it is, how pure it is or, or clean it is, or it doesn't have fentanyl or carfentanil in it or any of that stuff, um, it's still going to suppress one's uh, heart rate and, okay. and breathing and all that. And there are going to be overdoses no matter what. Or the, the flip side of that is going to be is that it's going to be too low strength for what people have been used to on the street, okay. which it, what, what they've purchased on the street, and they're going to need more. I'd like to interject some, some stories about yes, please, uh, please. Per, personal stories from, from my own experience and, and others who have talked to me about okay. uh, their struggle with substance abuse, specifically with, with opioids. And a lot of people started with, with pills. And it became right, okay. a financial decision for them to, to kind of transition to, to an opioid. It's one particular story that comes to mind, a, a gentleman who I knew, and uh, he had a back surgery. And okay. they prescribed him Oxycontin, and he was given maintenance supply 90 days, you know, and, and was taking it and taking it and taking mm -hmm. it. And for three years, he was taking it. And one day, he went back to the doctor's office, and they said, that's it. We're cutting you off. We right. can't give you any more Oxycontin. There was never a conversation about this medication could lead to uh, an addiction. Mm -hmm. There was never any, you know, when we take you off this, there's going to be withdrawal. There was never right. any conversation about this is what we're going to do when we take you off of it. Right. It was just, this is it, and uh, we want you to go home and stretch. We want you to go home and stretch. That's going to be your, your, your treatment going forward. And, and, and this poor gentleman tried ibuprofen and Tylenol and all this stuff. And uh, turn to the streets for the pills, yep. uh, which go for about a dollar a milligram. Okay. And he was taking 60 milligrams a day. That's sixty dollars a day. Yep. You know, over the course of a week, you're talking tons and tons of money. Yep. And uh, it became a financial decision for him to turn to heroin because it, essentially, it did the same thing. Correct. And it started with snorting it. Um, and then injecting it and yep. had to go buy it in the streets of New Haven. Yep. And even though he knew police officers yep. and all this other stuff, uh, he, got, he got snagged by statewide narcotics. Um, was actually handcuffed to the steering wheel of his vehicle. Lost his job, his family, his kids, yep. his house, everything. Yep. He lost everything. Yep. And it becomes very difficult. You know, you were talking about Chew and, and having right. people come. and right. uh, But there's still, to me, that's a lot like the methadone right. you know, model. And, and to me, that's like a prison sentence. Because although it may improve your quality of life, yep. to some degree you're not out there cheating and stealing and right. robbing and to get money to, to, to get your whatever it is that you want to get. Um, it's still a prison sentence to me in the, in, the, in the fact that you still have to go somewhere every day. You can't really leave, mm -hmm. right? I can't go on vacation. I can't go mm -hmm. to, you know, the California yeah. and say, well, you know, I got this card. I'm in, right. I'm in the Connecticut Heroin yeah. Users Union. And I give you kudos for trying yeah. to think outside the yeah. box and, 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 and try to, to help somebody in any way we can and meet them where we're at. We talked about right. that, meeting them where they're at. Right. Um, but it's still kind of, to me, a prison sentence in the yeah. fact that you can't just, uh, I, I would still have to go there every, every day to get my heroin and, and not be able to, you know, go out of, out of state and, and live a life. Listening to, to this man's experience, mm -hmm. it's, it's really almost, I hate to say it, typical of the profile of a person who develops a, a, a heroin, addic heroin or opioid addiction, right? Uh, it's not as if they were discoing back in the 70s <laughs> and just living up, you know, la vida loca right. and, and doing heroin in the bathrooms and, and this sort of stuff. I mean, these are working people who, have, as you mentioned, families. And, and it's, so, it's, it's always so tragic to hear these kinds of um, experiences, which to me, are completely unnecessary. Like in, in your uh, narrative, I would have liked to have been in the story the minute he, he knew he had to transition from when the doctor told him he had to be cut off and then he decided to hit the streets, right? That's the crucial part where he had to be forced into yeah. the under underworld, right? So he becomes vulnerable to drug dealers who knows what and the substances that he's ingesting he no longer knows it's not like the percocet pill that he got from his doctor which we right. know comes from a legitimate pharmaceutical uh 
fact, kind of want to highlight where we're agreeing on. I heard that uh, you're on board with the no BS, no yeah. blame, yeah. Uh, no shame, no mm -hmm. blaming, no shaming of these unfortunate individuals who have developed uh, an opioid or heroin yes. addict dependence, mm -hmm. right? So they're they're addicted to the stuff. Yeah. When you when you start talking to people about the heroin or opioid uh, crisis. Some will say, well, we have to have more education. We have to tell the kids and we have to you know, start talking to them in, in, in middle school or, or grammar school or kindergarten. Sure. And then there's another group that says, well, it should be prevention. You know, you should never even start. I agree with all that. Mm -hmm. So in, in the spectrum of avoidance and, 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 and not even getting started to uh, education, don't do it because it's dangerous, this and that, I'm all in agreement with all that effort. But where I am is, to address the, the population of our fellow citizens here in Connecticut who already have unfortunately crossed the line, right? So that's why we kick in with the no BS. We're not gonna blame you, we're not gonna shame right. you. Whether you develop the, the addiction from whatever set of circumstances, we're not we're not gonna go, go mm -hmm. over that and, and, and as they say in, in, in lawyerly terms, relitigate re that. We're already just gonna accept you for where you are. So then the, the next question is, how are we going to help you? Where I don't necessarily agree 100% with the industry or the effort that says you have to get clean, right? Because that's normally the reaction is somebody finds out somebody has a uh, heroin addiction or opioid dependence. They say, oh, we have to get fundraise and, and do all kinds of uh, um, efforts to, to raise money to, to open up more treatment beds and, and rehab beds. I'm saying, why? I mean, ask the person if they're ready for it, right? Because a rehab bed is anywhere from 10,000, 30,000. Um, oh, I, I just want to digress for a quick moment. Uh, there's a four-star admiral, right? Number two guy in, in all the United States Navy. His youngest son died of a heroin uh, accidental overdose, right? One of many unfortunate uh, stories that we're also familiar with. But the key there is, if you, you read their interviews, uh, they're saying that they spent the equivalent of four years tuition to an Ivy League school, which I tend to take as either $62,000 if you're boarding or maybe you know 42000 if you're a day student. But regardless, that's about 300000 to half a million dollars. Not everybody is a four-star admiral who has three hundred to 500000 And they said that. Right. They said they were lucky that they had that. But at the end of the day, their child still relapse or whatever, however that all that money spent on that rehab, the end result is he's not one of the individuals who is in our target zero, right? Because unfortunately he's, he's lost his life. I'd like to have a conversation, include the Admiral with us here to say, Admiral, you're a Navy guy, your, your whole career has been, you know, fixing problems, resolving issues and getting the mission accomplished. So if he joins us to say, our mission here is target zero, to have zero heroin overdose deaths in Connecticut. How are we gonna do that? So I'm saying, hey, we get everybody out of their secret lives, which earlier you and I were talking about, how many are there in Connecticut? Hmm. That was one of the things I wanted to do four years ago, is count every single heroin opioid addicted person in Connecticut. And of course, being one guy, I couldn't find it. Thanks to the doctors at Yale, we got the number, which is 105,000 Connecticut residents either are active users, former users, or in, in recovery today. I, I'd right? say that there's probably even more. Okay, but let's say- you're not, you're not gonna get to everybody. Right? Just for conversation's sake, a third of them are clean and have maintained sobriety. So that's 33,000, thank God, are there doing well. Let's say another third are in all kinds of levels of uh, medically assisted treatment, suboxone, in rehab, this is where the Connecticut Heroin Users Union comes in. My number one concern is the 30, the other one third who are still active users out there. So that's mm -hmm. 30,000. I did some quick math. If you have 33,000 uh, Connecticut residents having a 10 bag a day habit at $10 a day, that's 3.3 million a day. It would be 23 million a week, 92 million per month, 1.1 billion a year. So all of last year, 1.1 billion U.S. dollars left Connecticut and went who knows where, mm -hmm. right? And what do we have to show for it? Yeah, we have Narcan all over the place that Governor Molloy is trying to get for every first responder, and I understand that. And this is why 
I, I oppose that plan is because it's wasteful. Not every one of these 33,000, presumably, or active users right now are going to connect and hang out with a police officer or a firefighter or first responder and say, hey, Joe, I'm going to shoot up over there at the, you know, the bathroom at uh, some restaurant. Can you come with me? Because in case I overdose, you can hit me up with the Narcan. And that's why I'm saying it's wasteful. So if, instead of that uh, approach, why don't we bring the 33,000 and embrace them with this T idea of tolerance, acceptance, and empathy, and just say, come to a confidential clinic every day, and we will ask you, what is it that will take to make your day stable? So if you say, send me to rehab, we'll do our best to do that. Mm -hmm. But it's expensive, you know? 38,000, nobody can uh, well, uh, afford a, a that lot, every day. A lot of folks have, have state insurance uh, here. And, you know, to your point before about treatment being expensive and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff, I, I understand that. But it's very frustrating because I try to send people to who have state insurance to treatment and the beds are full. Right. And these are people who want to get clean okay. of, of their own admission. They want okay. to get clean. They, want, they don't want to do it anymore. I don't know too many people... Um, who are using heroin who have been using it for a very long time and say you know they still want to use it okay there's a lot of them a lot of them yeah who want to be off it and be clean they just don't know how to get there right? understood but see that that's to me that's the difficulty is because just because you and i won't know anybody who doesn't want to get clean part of the problem is is we don't really ask them because the whole atmosphere in, in, in the country or, or in our society now is, you have a heroin addiction, oh, you have to get clean. I look at the reverse. I mean, I, I, earlier in my legal career, I mean, uh, you know, as a, obviously as a, a new lawyer, you know, practice, take any case that comes in the door, and I did a lot of state uh, work. Quite a number of my clients were former heroin users. They started at 16 and they're now 53 years old. And I'm saying, how did you survive all this time? They will tell you the stories that half their friends from high school are dead because dead. Of, yeah. of, of, of a heroin overdose death. But still, you can see that within each individual's physical, I don't know, your makeup, your physiology, some people just can tolerate it. Some people are lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, some people just somehow just manage to survive. So I'm saying to myself, if we did not have these artificial barriers that force people, why don't we start by asking you, where is it that you would like to go? Where is it, what will it take to stabilize your day? And obviously because they're addicted to heroin, they're gonna need that all the time. We, we all know that, right? It, 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 you just can't get away from it. And even for those people who have been clean, whether it's, you know, you see it always in Facebook, you know, three years uh, clean and, and, you know, thank the Lord and, and thank everybody in the community, great. You know, we, we all support that. But you could even have people who have been 20 years clean, 30 years clean. If you look at the statistics, it's only 10% of people are fortunate enough to recover and kick the habit. Mm -hmm. But as I said, if, if you think about that actor who was clean for 20 years or 25 years, something down the line, they're 25 years old from now. When they're 45, they're 50, you know, they've been happily married, something else triggers them all of a sudden. You know, whatever that is, we don't know. You know, where do they turn for help? Right? Because now they've been paraded around, they've been in the newspaper, they've been, you know, been at all these wonderful awards dinners. And so the pressure is on them that they've been clean, they, they're sort of a model, recovered person. And I salute all that. But my concern for them as an individual is what happens when that dark moment comes back again? Who's there for you? Yeah. Well, and I want to, I, that's why I want to say we want you to be able to be there for you, to say, you know, call us up and, and we should be an established network, safety net for them really, so that they don't have to, like uh, that actor Hoffman, I, I think of this poor guy, he had to go back to, to the streets in New York to get his heroin that ultimately killed him. You know, unfortunately that, that reminds me of a, 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 young, a young woman that I uh, attempted to help. Okay. And she did go to treatment several times. Okay. And struggled uh, to All stay right. clean. You know, and we talked, and there was a lot of resources at her disposal, and uh, she got pregnant. Okay. And she got clean. Okay. She got clean, and she uh, gave birth to a daughter. Okay. And eight months later, I got a phone call. Yeah. Unfortunately, that she had relapsed. Okay. And overdosed. Okay. And died. And uh, okay. In her bathroom. Okay. With her child nursing. The reason that right. comes to me is because. We could give people all the resources in the world, right. but unless they engage in that, unless right. they 
actively participate, right? You know, it's it's not going to do a damn bit of good. If you trace back each of these stories of all these individuals with whom you've had a, an encounter with, it, if we mapped it out on a piece of paper, we could point out each point where they could have had a chance if they were on a situation like the Chu, where they did not either feel threatened or they did not feel under societal pressure to basically perform, right? You, you want to be say, hey, you're this model, former heroin addict who got married, uh, bore a child, and you're now, you know, this image, perfect sitting image of a Madonna and child, and then suddenly everybody finds you dead in a bathtub of an overdose. And so to me, it's an awful, awful and repetitive, really, story about how these individuals has, you know, I'd like to ask, I would have liked to have asked them, did at any point ever, anyone ever asked you, how is it that you really feel? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. do, do you really feel that this, you know, you're successful or this is what you want to do? Or what if you're feeling weak and vulnerable and about to relapse? Do you feel as if you can always have somebody to turn to or will the people you turn to say, gee, you know, after all this, time and money effort we spend on you, you're going to relapse? I mean, you know what I mean? That's the, that's, I, know, I know exactly that's, what I mean. I right. hear those stories every right. day. That's, that's, that's the point where I want to catch these individuals and say, do not lose hope because we want to, you know, that's the empathy part of we feel your pain and then that's where the acceptance comes in. Mm -hmm. And we're say, we're going to accept you that if you relapse, it's okay. You know, it's not, it's not, you're not losing the battle because there's really it's, there's no battle to be won to be lost here. Mm -hmm. The whole point is really to keep people safe mm -hmm. and to support them at all levels, from the time they develop the addiction to the time that they've been able to successfully go through a recovery process, right? But we know that the success rate and, and the recovery programs is only 10 percent. So my concern is the, the other nine, the other 90 percent. What happens to those individuals and who looks up for them? I told you we could talk about it. Yes, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree.